How do you follow that? <laughs> Except to say uh, good afternoon and welcome to Chester Cathedral. I'm Tim Stratford, the Dean here, and I'm really pleased that you've come to join us today to worship God. Uh, and an especially warm welcome to uh, Nick Bundock, who I can see at the back, Rector of Emmanuel Church, Didsbury, from Manchester Diocese. He's our preacher today. Uh, and to all those of you, including the Proud Mary's Choir just behind me, uh, who've made a special journey to help lead our worship. Uh, we don't welcome bishops normally here in the cathedral because they belong to the cathedral community. Uh, but uh, Bishop Julie, we're very pleased that you are here amongst us to lead us in this act of worship. Uh, of course, the people of God and the followers of Jesus Christ uh, are a diverse bunch. Just look at us. Uh, we are a reflection of the rich diversity of humankind, and so we should be. And we celebrate that this afternoon in our worship. Uh, now, just a couple of things, because not everything in this cathedral works as it should do. Uh, I need to say, if any of you are hard of hearing uh, or hearing aid users, and would normally benefit from a loop, the best advice we can give here today, and I'm terribly sorry about this, is if you sit as close as you can to a speaker, uh, your hearing aid uh, should uh, pick sound up uh, reasonably well. Uh, if uh, your sight uh, is poor, uh, and you would like to sit closer to a monitor, there's two monitors in the nave, uh, you'll be able to see all of the text that you need for our service on those monitors, and also the video feed might help you see well. Uh, but also, I think a number may have chosen to sit at the front, which is even better. Um, now, you're probably used to standing uh, to sing hymns. Can I ask you in the third hymn of this service not to do that? Uh, the hymn is My Jesus, My Saviour. We have a signing choir uh, for that hymn, and you will see their singing in sign much better if you remain seated. Our worship begins now, or should I say continues, after the music that we have had uh, with the hymn There is a Wideness in God's Mercy. When the organ begins to play, please stand and we can sing together. Thank you.
Do please sit. It is my privilege to add to Dean Tim's welcome and to welcome you again. You get welcomed a lot, but what interests me is as I go around churches in Chester Diocese, I have noticed that in most of them, the people in the congregation are not as diverse as the people in their community. And that suggests to me that we might be better at exclusion than we are at welcome, which is tragic. And it's particularly tragic because we have a God whose love is immense, who loves us as we are, exactly as we are, not despite who we are, not that we might become someone else, not by pretending that we are someone else. And in that love, we flourish. It's also a love that is hugely challenging because as we flourish in that love, we become more than we might ever have imagined. How sad that we forget that love. We come with grief when people discriminate against each other. Diminishing the dream for the community of human life, the light of God is hidden. We come with pain when we have remained silent in the face of prejudice directed at someone else. And left in despair those who suffer hatred, pain and exclusion when, when we, we have, have turned our eyes away. We come with sorrow for the physical, emotional, psychological and spiritual violence and suffering inflicted upon God's children, whose, whose gifts, gifts and humanity are different, different from ours by, by what we have done and, and in what we have failed to do. We come with shame before you, aware that we have remained silent in the face of hate and discrimination directed at someone else by shutting our eyes away and turning our backs on those who feel second rate and whose voices are ignored. Let us pray. God of amazing grace, in you we find a life stronger than death. By your word, you bring order out of chaos and all things are made new. Give us grace to see your truth so we may sing of a love that sets your people free. We ask this in the name of our living Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's lovely to welcome everybody this afternoon. I'd, I'd like to particularly ask Julie if you would like to come forward. Uh, can you come, are you ready, ready now? She's just walked in, poor love. So uh, uh, can I introduce to you Julie Okundai, who is the chair of the Diocesan Race and Ethnicity Forum. Julie, come and stand up here. There's the microphone. I would have gone through this before you with, with, with you. So I, this poor love is going to now have all this thrown at her. But it's, Julie, it's great to have you with us today, and this is obviously a very special time uh, for our diocese. But um, the Race and Ethnicity Forum, tell us a, a little bit about who you are and what your role is in that. Uh, so I'm Julia Kunde, as I've just been introduced. Um, I'm a mum of two boys. I work um, as an IT program director at Barclays, and I live in Stockport. Great. Well, it's, it, and it's been great to have you as our diocesan uh, Race and Ethnicity Forum Chair. Uh, why do you think diversity issues are important for a diocese like ours, which, let's be honest, is almost universally white? Um, uh, 
diversity at the end of the day, right, is it's um, a mix of um, visible and invisible identity. So you see who I am, you see me as black, you don't know my back history. Um, sometimes, you know, you, we, there are barriers in, in conversations. Um, so diversity is about openness. Um, we're in the house of God. Um, we worship under the same um, ministry. Um, race shouldn't matter, but it does matter. It matters that we have, continue to have the conversations, not just about race, but diversity of all, you know, sure. images. Yes. Sure. So, um, obviously, it's been, it's been in the news an awful lot, particularly since the death of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter campaign that followed from that. What would you say to people who kind of feel, uh, we're a bit tired of hearing of it, we want to kind of move on from that? How would you respond to that? The, con the, the conversations haven't ended, and it will never end. We always have to continue to see difference as well as similarities. Um, at work this week, I had to say to my manager that the way you speak to my white counterpart has to be different from how you speak to me, because how I will take the information is different from how somebody else will take the information. So we have to be careful about what we say, how we project, within the, especially within the church. Right? So for me to be open and for you to see me for who I am, I need to be comfortable and I need to feel like I belong. And for me to feel like I belong, you need to embrace all of us. Well, you certainly belong here. Take that as, as read. But um, given that we're, a t we're talking about diversity this afternoon, what's the ch one change that, or what are, are the changes that you would most like to see? Conscious inclusivity. So always knowing that your brothers and sisters in the church of different ethnicity are involved in the conversation not just assuming that they are, but ensuring that they are by having asked the question, do you, do you understand, do you, yeah. you know, you, do you feel you're part of this? Absolutely. So it's conscious inclusivity. That's what I would like to see. Brilliant. We'll be praying for that, Julie. Thank you very much for coming to be with us this afternoon. Thank you for all you're doing in serving God in the way you are in the diocese. Can we give her a big clap, please, everybody? Would you like If you're able, we're going to sing our next hymn, O oh God, You Search Me and You Know Me.
whether you actually saw what was happening just then, but I think this is Poppy, isn't it? It is. This, this, is, this is Linda. Linda. <laughs> we welcome you, Linda. And this is Poppy. And actually what was happening was that, that Poppy was actually bringing the order of service um, up to, to help Linda. And, and I know that, Linda, Poppy is one of your assistance dogs, or, or she's the one that's working with you at the moment, isn't she? And you have also have Obi over there that's right and he's retired yeah. now is that right, that's right. He, he retired last christmas right okay yes. so i wonder if you can tell us a little bit about you and also about how your assistance dogs help you um right how long have we got <laughs> um well i've been in a wheelchair for quite a long time um the condition i was born with uh, hypermobility syndrome and I've also got seronegative rheumatoid arthritis and a couple of other things. Um, prior to getting OB, I was more or less housebound, um, unless my husband, Ricky over there, um, was able to take me out. I couldn't go out. Um, so when I got OB, we had a whole new life change. Okay, are we going to hold that? Sorry, excuse me. Okay, good, good girl. Um, thank you, Poppy. She's very helpful. She's very eager. <laughs> Um, and one of the things that I found having Obi was the change to my life um, in that I was able to go out. So it enabled me to have freedom that I didn't have before. Um, but also out in the community, having the dog actually breached that gap in the social sector between someone in a wheelchair and someone... Um, it's not that people don't want to speak to you, but they're not quite sure how to approach you. But when you've got a dog, there's sometimes a common bond. They want to talk. So the dog is the opener, really, in okay. that way. Um, but he also helped me to do things that I wanted to do. I actually uh, joined Design Choir um, okay. with my husband, Ricky, just before we had OB. I was very nervous. I shocked terrible. And I thought, I don't know if I can do this. And then I got OB and my confidence started to grow. I felt less nervous and uh, was able to do a lot more. He also supports me at my Bible study fellowship that I do every week. I've been a group leader there nice. for many years. And instead of me saying, oh, sorry, can you get that for me? I've just dropped it or can you do this for me? The dogs actually now do that. If okay. I drop something, now it's Poppy. She'll pick it up That's for me, fabulous. open and shut and doors things like that's that that's great so in terms then of church when you go when you're trying to get into a church do you, do you believe that and feel that dogs assistance dogs are welcome in church but my experience is i've found them welcome in the churches we've been to i've not been in any that haven't been welcoming my problem is not the dogs but the wheelchair <laughs> yeah um so yeah but the dogs have always been welcomed um so you know, in that sense, I've not experienced any negative yes. uh, reaction to the dogs. Yes. Um, so in terms of... To know them, not you. Okay. Oh, <laughs> so that's good. To know you, that's Linda. fine, because that takes the pressure off you, and you can talk about your dog. Yeah. So that's good. That's great. So considering the broader picture of accessibility, then, um, to everything in the church, what do you think the church could do better? I think one of the biggest things for me is, is the access. Um, Buildings, every effort being made to ensure a building is accessible, but also not just through the front door or the back door. Uh, church I've been to, the, the access was at the back, um, which was fine because you could still get in the building. Um, but also when you're in the building, making sure that uh, all the doors are actually accessible for people to be able to move around in a wheelchair. Um, it can be difficult to know what each person's needs are, so it's important to listen to those needs. Um, but I think that's one of the biggest things for me, it's the access moving around yeah. a building. Yeah. And little things like, some people use the disabled toilets for storage. And I've been in some churches and I'm like, sorry, I'd like to go to the toilet, but I can't get yeah. my chair in there. Yeah. And they've got to empty things out or they've blocked a corridor with chairs. Yes. So there's things like that, the yeah. practical things that yeah. help a person in which I feel yeah. welcomed. And I think actually the, the attitude as well, attitudes yes. and educating people yes. in how they can support and how we can listen and empower you yes. Um, yes. To, to be included. Yes. If you could offer one piece of advice then for our church leaders, about how they might enable and empower um, those in, in 
perhaps with different abilities in leadership positions or, or just to participate in a service, what would that one piece of advice be? So I, I would actually say for all clergy and all PCC members uh, or anyone else interested, actually get on board with the disability awareness uh, course. Um, there is nothing like some personal experience. Um, I think it'd be wonderful to put a few into a wheelchair and say, right, off you go. Um, if you understand that a little bit better, it helps. But I think also how you welcome people, it's not to uh, treat them differently, but to treat everyone equally. That's fantastic, thank you. One of the things we do at the diocese is that we have a disability forum, a diocesan disability forum, and, and we do offer that training. So please do look out um, for that. You'd be very welcome to come along. And um, it's, sometimes it's online, but, but um, please do join us and look out for that training. Thank you so much, Thank Linda. You. It's an absolute joy to meet you and your lovely Thank dogs you. and our continued prayers for you in your ministry. Okay. In a moment, I'm going to invite Matt Baker up to come and give our third conversation. I'm the kind of presenter here. One of my responsibilities is about the worship in the cathedral. And within three months of coming here, uh, I was told that the service, the cathedral was quite a quiet place. It was a very beautiful place. And, but got the news that we were going to appoint the, ninth, the eighth bishop of Stockport. And for us, with our stories here, that was the first female bishop, Bishop Libby. Uh, it was nothing new to me. I've been working with Bishop Marianne in the United States. So uh, how could we get a service for her that was truly diverse and inclusive? And there was one real big problem, is that some of the music that got talked about was all by men. 
I'm pleased to say this afternoon that three out of the four hymns are composed by women, um, but they're the best hymns for the service. And we want to make sure that ever since that moment when Bishop Libby joined us here on the cathedral uh, staff and diocese, that actually we make sure that all voices are heard. And it's been a real story over nine years nearly to make sure that our hymn writers are not just proclaiming the gospel afresh for each generation, but actually it's all voices being heard. And if we look in the last week in the news, both in music and diversity, it's extraordinary how some of these voices are still now being heard for the first time. Uh, I love BBC Young Musician of the Year. It's usually on in uh, May, but because of time, re timetable and everything, it was last week, it was the final was in the Bridgewater Hall in Manchester. And uh, having six years ago in the very same place, Sheikou Kana Mason, whose music as a cellist, and I'm a cellist myself, has rung through this country at the proms, at royal weddings, and being the best person to offer a cellist's music up with a story of his faith from Nottingham, we had in Black History Month another amazing story of another kind of history that needs to be heard of. And in a moment, Sue and Garant are going to share some of their stories in proclaiming the gospel in the reading from Galatians. And that story was that Ethan Locke, who was the category finalist as a pianist, Ethan communicates how he sees through what he hears. He was the first blind uh, competitor in that uh, amazing competition. And he didn't win the final competition, but he got through to the keyboard final. And that's another story of making sure that all people can play and music can be heard. And music, as a musician, is a real gift. Music is about singing rather than spitting. Because the same day in Winchester Cathedral, Baroness Fluella Benjamin preached at their legal service. Please go and watch it online, and it would be good to have her from Baroness Fluella Benjamin of Beckenham, from where Julie has her former diocese. It would be coming worth to hear Fluella's story for us, maybe for next year, because she spoke about what it is for people not to sing, but to be spat at. And she spoke of all the people, including herself, people of diversity, disability, orientation, colour, people who are spat at. But then she said at the end of her word there, with its dean, Catherine Ogle, along with our dean about celebrating diversity, was saying that actually, how can you turn it round is singing and smiling, something so important. Well, that was Sunday. Tuesday, you might enjoy watching the BBC Dementia Choir, which is on BBC on Tuesday in the evenings, with Vicky McClure. How do choirs come together to actually bring people together of different diversities? In this case, obviously, dementia. And then two members of our congregation walked in this morning. They'd been to another cathedral yesterday where they spoke about a new choir that established it in their cathedral. Maybe we could look at ourselves. Big choir for people over 65. It's not a pensioners' choir, it's people over 65. And they also spoke about a choir that was also in the same cathedral where they have 42 probationers of young people because the cathedral is searching in its diversity to reach out for people who would not usually come near a cathedral. Story to learn, story to share. In cathedrals, we do that. But one of the stories of Chester, certainly the city here, is a man who makes music in Chester. Chester Music Man, as he's known, someone who was given the BEM by Lady Redmond, our new Lord Lieutenant, handed to him last year, and that's maker, Matt Baker. Would you welcome Matt to come up and have a conversation with me? Oh, yeah, Matt. Yeah, that's fine. Cool. Matt, this is a cathedral you know and love. You were here launching the Mystery Plays uh, just last Thursday. About 250 people here. And we're welcoming, looking forward to welcoming thousands here of different people from all walks of life. And that's the Mystery Plays does that. And you were given not just for the work you do with that community, but so many communities here in the city. You were given the BEM. What did that mean to you? 
Uh, well, it was, a, it was a, an amazing honor to be, um, well, to have an honor from the Queen, sadly, who's passed now, but um, uh, it, it was a wonderful honor. I, I, I do represent and bring together a, a, a range of different uh, communities together, whether that's uh, the mystery plays or um, I have an, an adult, a, a choir of adults with additional needs, uh, university choir, uh, a choir of women who all hold handbags. I'm not sure how, div div how diverse that is, but... And of course, the Proud Marys, which is uh, Chester's uh, first and only LGBT choir. And obviously, you're organist of a local church here, Anglican church here in the city, and you have a choir there and everything. Just tell us a bit about how music brings people from diversity together. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I mean, music in itself, irrespective of the communities, music transcends uh, uh, communities. Music speaks a whole new language and a language for everybody. Um, I know that the, the choirs that I run all have different roles. Um, it's amazing that this choir here, uh, it was an idea to bring together uh, people of the LGBT community and that started just before the pandemic and now we have a 50, 60 strong community of people, the LGB, LGBT community. There are people in this choir, um, some of the older members, who say they've met more people uh, that they identify with as LGBT than they have met in the whole life. And that's something rather uh, incredible, really. And I know some of you are Christians. You worship in churches. Uh, you rehearse in a church school. And so, as Julie said, Bishop Julie said, welcome. It's good to have you along with D-Sign Choir as well. Um, tell us about, about some of the, perhaps, features, why people need to get to the, need to come together with the choir um, because of maybe some of the isolation, exclusion, prejudice, some of the things that Fluella Benjamin was talking about in Winchester Cathedral last week. Tell us a bit about why choirs make a difference. Um, well, I can give a, ca a case study. Um, okay. One member um, of our choir who has actually just left, gone back to China, uh, dear Brian, he won't mind me using him as a case study, he arrived in Chester um, a year ago because he came from China, well, uh, it could have been other countries as well, he had to isolate, and he was isolating for 10 days, uh, felt incredibly lonely, and when he came out, he didn't have anybody to, uh, to meet, he just walked into St. Thomas's Church, and uh, saw there was a rehearsal going on there, and said, I, I kind of sing a bit, can I, can I join? I'm, I'm learning English as well. He joined that choir, then when he heard me mention LGBT in the notices, uh, he suddenly popped into that choir, and... Uh, well, the rest is history. He has uh, led his best life this year. <laughs> we can certainly say that. Um, and uh, has felt completely included. Uh, all that, that sense of isolation disappeared. And that was through being in, well, more than one choir. Uh, he was also the thief on the cross in the, in the City oh, Passion. Yes. He really immersed himself. But he did say when he left, if he hadn't walked into that church door, uh, just across the road from where he was staying, he wouldn't have, he would have been on his own, basically. And our doors are open this afternoon. If you'll turn to have a look, you can see Nick out there. Um, people have been coming in and out of the service. This is really important that the church welcomes everybody. And um, obviously the big thing we work, we'll be welcoming next year is the mystery plays. And um, just tell us, just before we move on to a bit of singing with you, mm -hmm. uh, about some of the diversity in sharing God's story, an ancient story here, and how that worked five years ago when I was um, here, when it was 2018, and how is it going to work next year? Well, I think the purpose of the Mystery Plays originally was to engage people outside. When, when everything was in Latin, then the, the whole purpose of the Mystery Plays was to tell people who perhaps couldn't speak Latin mm. about the stories of the Bible. Um, it goes way, way, way beyond that now, and the, the Mystery Plays we aim for it to be one of the most inclusive community productions in the country. Uh, and so as we speak right now, there are over 200 people auditioning to play roles that come from all backgrounds. Next week, I'll be um, welcoming as many people who want to be in the chorus. And again, they will be drawn from all the different choirs. I, I think what's also important to say, and, and, and that's the visibility of, of choirs. So yes, I work with the university choir. They uh, they might perform out there, and one good thing for their visibility is it, it makes people think, our oh, students aren't all bad, those ones that are uh, making all the noise at night. But if you imagine 
than a, an adult choir with disabilities who are out there performing. It shows what people can do, what's brilliant about these people, the talent that they have. Similarly, with uh, the uh, Proud Marys, they are out there in, uh, at Pride, and there is a huge positive uh, r uh, example of the LGBT community. It's still important today because even on that day, some of our members went off with wearing their, their logo and uh, uh, experienced verbal abuse. That's why these things are important. And the mystery plays will be an amalgam of all those choirs and more, anybody who wants to be involved. I'm so looking forward to it and bringing, well, I'm moving to a new parish, but I'm looking forward to bringing my team up there with you. Um, and now, tell us a bit about the song which we're gonna be led into with you. Um, and your story, which you want to share with us. It's a good one. Okay, uh, well, uh, uh, Proud Marys is now uh, five years old and welcomes people from the whole spectrum of the LGBT uh, community. Uh, there's many songs that I think we could have brought today. Uh, we have chosen uh, um, a song which, well, the words will speak for itself from the, uh, the film and musical Dear uh, uh, Evan Hansen, and it's You Will Be Found. Okay, over to you, Matt. Thank you.
to the Galatians, chapter 3, verses 23 to 29. Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian, for in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Gentile. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. According to the promise. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. Good afternoon. It's lovely to be here. It's such an honor, it really is. Thank you so much for inviting me. And, and if there's anything I say this afternoon that, that causes offense, then at least know that I'll be going back to Manchester in about half an hour. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say a couple of things before I, I really kick off, and, and that is that I honestly don't have anything to add beyond what Julie has said, and Linda has said, and Matt has shared with you this afternoon. Um, my story really is the story of another. I'm simply telling that story. The second thing uh, that I wanted to say uh, to you this afternoon is, and I do this whenever I share this story, just by way of a warning, is that the story I am about to tell you does involve suicide. And so I think it's important, those of you who feel particularly vulnerable here today do know that if you need uh, to go and find somewhere else to be for a little while. Because what I don't want to do when I come to speak to a group of, of dear people such as yourselves is to cause any more trauma for you. We've just had a, a reading that was so beautifully read. And um, St. Paul said in that reading, Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law. Up until the 10th of September 2014, I feel that I was like St. Paul, imprisoned and guarded under the law. Faith hadn't yet come. I was a prisoner to the law. 
Now that will sound strange to people who know me because I've actually been a Christian since I was 14 years of age. In fact, I became a Christian at a Billy Graham rally in 1989 in Wembley Stadium. So for those of you who might doubt it, I'm the real deal. (laughs) I'm a proper evangelical. What I didn't know on the 10th of September 2014 was that that was going to be my last day in that imprisoned state. The 10th of September 2014, which of course you're by now wondering what on earth is the significance of that date. Well, the first significance of that date is that it is World Suicide Prevention Day, 10th of September every year. But in 2014, 14-year-old Lizzie Lowe took her own life in a field behind my church in Manchester. And this dreadful death, violent death, became for me both my great burden and simultaneously the key that unlocked the prison door. Over the past eight years, this same key has unlocked the lives of countless people up and down the country, in communities within the Church of England and beyond, and up and down the length and breadth of the country and across the world. I'd known Lizzie since she was a little girl. She'd played with my own children. I'd watched her perform in school nativities. Lizzie was the innkeeper in a school nativity. She had this beautiful singing part. I'd watched her grow into a confident, beautiful and talented young woman. Lizzie and her family were, and her family still are, core members of our church community, some of whom are here today. To lose a child like that to suicide is a punch to the stomach like I've never experienced. To lose a child like this to suicide when it became clear that it was because of a conflict between her sexuality and her faith was unforgivable. Except it was. What a safeguarding tragedy that in churches in our own country today, this can still happen to children because of conflicts between faith and sexuality. It's a failure of religion, it's a failure of safeguarding, and to my shame, my failure, my failure of leadership in that church community. Lizzie's death and the subsequent coroner's hearing and media storm that resulted propelled me and my broadly evangelical Anglican South Manchester Church into a process which one can only call now with hindsight repentance. Now that's a word you don't hear very often in regard to inclusion, but that's what we had to do. We had to repent. But I can completely understand why so many of my brothers and sisters and siblings in the Church of England struggle with this issue of faith and sexuality, because as Paul said in the reading, there's something so comforting in the law. If I know what's in and what's out, what's right and what's wrong, it keeps me safe. Particularly if they out there are the other. It guards us. A disciplinarian telling us what to believe, what to think. And statements of the Bible says variety can be so comforting as long as we're on the inside. But it was on the road to Damascus that St. Paul finally realized that he had blood on his hands. 
and that the good he thought was doing was actually persecuting the God he thought he was serving. And it is a frightening conceit that if we claim orthodoxy and yet are doing harm, but it's not one without biblical precedent. Look at St. Paul. Look at me. You don't even have to go back 2,000 years to see this. Lizzie's death was like this for me. And sometimes it takes something as shocking as a suicide of a 14-year-old girl to kick the theological cartwheels out of the rut that they've dug for themselves. To call Lizzie's death a personal paradigm shift is an understatement. It was a revelation to me in every way. I walked out of the coroner's hearing in December 2014 and I said to myself, our church will change. We will change. This will not happen again. I will go the length and breadth of the country to make sure that the church changes. What I didn't realize at the time was that changing the church was the easy part. Changing me was the hard part. Thankfully, because of Lizzie, mercifully because of Lizzie, the church does not need to have a suicide in every parish. But believe you me, there is a Lizzie in every parish in this country. Every single one. Thanks to Lizzie, we can all continue to learn what it means to love mercy and not sacrifice. Or to quote St. Paul again, now that faith has come, we no longer need a disciplinarian because in Christ Jesus we are all children of God through faith. All of us. All of us. And particularly, I say to my wonderful friends in this LGBT choir, brothers and sisters and siblings of mine and the church, and more importantly, of God. A few years after Lizzie died, I made a video with John Bell from the Iona community. John decided that he'd been touched so deeply by Lizzie's death that he wanted to say publicly about his own sexuality. We made two videos, one about my church, one about his journey. The lowest quality videos you're ever likely to see in your life. They have been watched tens of thousands of times. I now hear about churches which have been kicked out of their own denominations because they've become inclusive. Do you know what I say now when people say to me, you know, this isn't, you know, you're, you're going against God. I say, I don't care. I would rather go against God and stand with my brothers and sisters who are gay or trans or non-binary or anyone who finds themselves excluded. I would rather stand with them and pay the price. And that is what my conversion has done. Be of good courage. Be of good courage. What of our own church? What of St. James and Emmanuel? Well, <laughs> one of the things that was told to me immediately by some of the departing members, of which there were a number, was, your church is going to go to the dogs now. Oh, yeah. Well, the BBC came and did a documentary about us after our first Pride event in 2018, held in the church grounds, organized by the church. <laughs> it wasn't dead, and it hadn't gone to the dogs. You know, now when I look around on a Sunday morning in St. James and Emmanuel, I used to see a beautiful church, don't get me wrong, it was a wonderful community, but it was very monocultural. I'll put it that way. But now when I look out on Sunday morning, I say, the Lord be with you. 
And they all say, and also with you. And I look out on gay men, gay women, same-sex couples, transgender members, non-binary members, those exploring, those who know who they are, those who aren't sure who they are, those who never thought they'd find another Christian home ever again. But more than that, and this is the miracle, this is the miracle, this is the prize. This is the prize. Now when I look out on Sunday, I see 50 to 100 Iranians. I see a congregation of South Asian Christians. I see a community of adults with learning difficulties. I see people with dementia, I see people with autism, I see the elderly, I see black, I see white, I see children, I see elderly people. I see all of humanity gathered before this table. Because when you make the church safe for one group, you make it safe for everybody. Everybody. The Church of England isn't dead. It's asleep. I don't have to go out into the highways and byways of Didsbury to bring people into St. James and Emmanuel. They come to us because they know they're going to be welcome. Paul, St. Paul didn't quite get to the stage where he could possibly have understood human sexuality and sexual diversity. How on earth could Paul have understood that 2,000 years ago? How on earth? But he points the way to this wonderful emancipation because that's what this is, an emancipation that God is ushering in through his son Jesus Christ. Listen to these words. There is no longer Jew or Greek or slave or free. There is no longer male or female. I could add to this list. There is no longer black or white. There is no longer gay or straight. There is no longer cis or trans, binary or non-binary. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Trace the ark. Look at scripture, see what's happening. Don't pick one little verse. Look what it's telling us. It's as clear as day where the destination lies and it looks like this. All of you, all of you, all of you, welcome before the table. Don't let anybody tell you it's any different to that. That's where we're headed, folks. Don't stop. Keep going. One day the Church of England will realise again that the clue is in the name. The Church of all England, not bits of it. The destination is a beautiful one. Beautiful. You are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Never forget it. Amen. A moment of peace as we prepare our hearts and minds to come before God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, your word tells us that there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Creator God, we thank you for the diverse humanity you have created for this world. From every nation, from all tribes and people, from all languages, all with different skills and abilities. 
we thank you for the millions of people around the world who are your church. We acknowledge that human diversity is an expression of your love for your creation. But we confess that in our brokenness as human beings, some might turn diversity into a source of alienation, injustice, oppression, and wounding. We pray for those who have been excluded deliberately or unintentionally. We ask for your forgiveness that by our own wrongdoing, we have turned people away from your grace. We pray that as the church, we would find ways to give thanks and celebrate diversity by truly including all people in service, leadership, and worship. Enrich our lives by ever-widening circles of friendship and show us your presence in us and in those who differ most from us until our knowledge of your love is made perfect in our love for all your children, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God of peace, we pray for places around the world where there is war and violence. We pray for the people of Iran, Ukraine, Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Lord, bring your peace to these and other hurting places, that they may know the reassurance of your presence and the hope of your future. We pray for places around the world where there is disease or famine. We pray for the people of Ethiopia, Nigeria, South Sudan, and Somalia. We also pray for the people of the United Kingdom, those who are struggling to feed their families, heat their homes, and pay their bills. We pray for your provision. Help us to be generous and share our resources with others. Lord, we pray for our leaders, both of the church and governments, Give them wisdom and foresight alongside deep compassion and empathy to lead people to a fair and just world, to become a place of love, compassion, and harmony. Make strong in our hearts that which unites us, build bridges across all that divides us, united Make us rejoice in your creation and at one in witness to your peace. Amen. Longing for the fulfillment of God's kingdom of love, let us pray as our Saviour taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Let us carry the light of God into the world. Let, Let us rebuild love and justice in the creative power of God. God. May we be embraced with gifts from God, the one, the one who, who celebrates, celebrates all creation and gathers all people together in love. May the Christ walk beside us all, adding to our lives 
the courage to believe that we are called to be beloved people of God, facing each day with hope and grace. And may the Holy Spirit, the source of wisdom amid the flames of true life, lift our hearts with joy and the wonder of divine inspiration for our future. If you're able, do stand for our final hymn. There came a generation who rose to claim the hour. It has been an absolute joy to be here in the cathedral this afternoon to be worshipping God with all of you. So thank you to those who put this service together for the cathedral, for hosting. Thank you as well. And thank you to everybody who took part and to each and every one of you for being here. Please bow your heads as we pray for God's blessing. The love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. And the joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.